Spreadsheets are a very important tool to know how to use both in the business world and in the mathematics or physical sciences world because you can actually use them to calculate tons of data and graph them nicely. They're also used useful around the home. They are also useful around the home for tracking maybe personal finances or making a family phone list or some other examples and I'll show you some examples shortly. In this presentation I have several different areas that I'm going to go through so this is a long presentation however you can skip to the video if you know how to do parts of these and skip ahead just look for these blue slides. Just a quick overview of spreadsheet programs that are available to you. The industry standard if you go to any any business, any major business, and go work there, you will see that they will use Microsoft Excel. And it's part of the Microsoft Office package of tools. It um, costs about $150 for a personal license, and I would recommend that you buy it. You get the most professional product out of these, and it has the most advanced functionality. Sometimes they tend to overdo it with the functionality, and they tend to reorganize everything every four or five years, which really annoys me, but what can you do? OpenOffice is basically a knockoff of Microsoft Office. Um, it's free. You can go online and uh, look up the download or you can go to my wiki. Um, and it's very close to Excel's capabilities. So I would recommend this package if you don't have Microsoft Office. Last and least is Google Sheets. The only upside to Google Sheets is that they allow you to collaborate. And this is very similar to Google, Google Docs. You can go onto Google and they have several applications. This is one of the applications. It doesn't have nearly the functionality of Excel or OpenOffice. Over time, the functionality has improved, so perhaps over time it'll get up to par with the other ones. The first thing you'll need to do before you set up a spreadsheet, you'll have to plan the layout. Of course, it's hard to plan your layout if you have never made a spreadsheet before, so I'm going to show you a few examples, some business examples, some home examples, and some engineering and physics examples that I've used. So I'll start with a simple business example. Here's an example of a spreadsheet I made recently to track my expenses and submit it. And I've got some nice tables summarizing in three different categories what I spent things on, the dates, the totals for each receipt, a, a brief description. Down below, I subtotaled these values and came up with a total for each category. And then these categories, as you can see, I have one of these for each one of these tables are actually linked up to the table up above. So if you watch, if I were to change one of my numbers, let me pick this number, change this to $500. If you watch up top here, when I hit enter, it updates everything in the table. So everything is connected, and that's the value of a spreadsheet. So here's another example. This is from home, obviously. Uh, Sophia is learning multiplication. So I used Excel just to make a very nice little chart that's very neatly organized and formatted. Now for the last several years in my class we've been going online and entering data for light pollution surveys. and They're automatically recorded by the website and then every year about 16 or 20,000 people submit entries but I can actually go in and pull up a selection of these entries and download them into an Excel spreadsheet. And so this is the Excel spreadsheet pulling together all the entries that my students made in the class. Um, and I was able to give them a certain radius to search and they pulled those out for me and I saved them as what's called a CSV file, comma separated variables. Excel can automatically read those files in that data in and then turn it into a spreadsheet format for me, which I formatted a little bit. And what you can see here is I've got the student's observation ID telling me so I can track their work, but also their names are showing up in the sky comma column. And just to show you one of the features of the spreadsheet, we're really using the spreadsheet in this case. I'm not doing any calculations with this spreadsheet, but I'm using it as essentially as a database. And there are special programs to manage data like this in a database, um, but spreadsheets have basic functionalities in the series as well. Here, I'm going to use the sort tool up here, and it automatically highlights the table, assuming this is the data I would like to sort, and it automatically looks to see if up top I have one row which has all my column titles in it, and it picks those. And so I can actually sort, and I do have this sorted by sky column right now. I'm going to I'll sort in Z to A in descending order, and you can watch, and and you can see I've sorted. Now here's my period four students, and this, and then if you go down here's my period three students, here's my period one students, and so on and so forth. So here's another example. 
And this is similar to the example we're going to be working on to set to lay out our first spreadsheet. Uh, this is data I collected off a of video for a Corvette, and what I've done is I've went through the video frame by frame and recorded the time of the video, and I recorded the speed showing up on the speedometer. So for this data, you'll see I have about 400 points of data. I'll scroll down to show you in a moment. But basically, I only had to put in the first two columns, and then the other columns I have calculated using equations based on that. And you can see up above here, here's an example of an equation that I used. And then after I created all this data, I was able to use it to make some very nice looking graphs. And this once again shows the the features that are available in Excel that you would not be able to do to get something this professionally made in Google or OpenOffice. OpenOffice is close though. Yeah. So I was able to make graphs of the object's position, velocity, and accelerate. And then these tables I can actually cut and paste right into a Word document for my lab handouts for my students. So this is a really interesting spreadsheet. And this is a good example of how you can use it to manipulate data and do some interesting things. So this is a, a project that I had students building bridges and on just an online bridge design program. And the bridges were graded based on who had the lowest cost. The cheapest bridge got, got a top score of 101.5. And actually, this number up, up here, the 1.5, is the number that the spreadsheet is using to calculate the second, third, fourth place. You can see we drop by 1.5 in each case. If I were to change this to 2, for example, you see all my numbers down here uh, drop. Or I could change by 5 points each and drop everything down to a very low grade. But I was dropping by increments of 1.5 points. And, and then I had a series of calculations that I did that allowed the students who were in second, third, fourth place, and so on and so forth, if they were within a certain percentage of the person before them, for example, $142,653 versus $142,219, there's only a $400 difference out of $140,000. So it doesn't seem fair to take off that many points for somebody who's that close to the person in front of them. And so these little boxes show you how many points that the students earned back for being within 5 or 10 percent of the person or people in front of them. And so this, this is what I call their buyback points. And over the right column I show their, their grade with the buyback points. So you can see for example this person who was a 97 in fourth place ended up with a 99 and the person down here in the 15th slot had an 80.5, but he ended up going to an 83.5 with the buyback points. Um, I had one of these spreadsheets for each one of the bridges we did. And then at the end, I pulled together everybody's grades into one spreadsheet. And these are linked to the other spreadsheets. So any changes I made on the other spreadsheets, and you can see I clicked into one of these cells, it's pointing back to my second spreadsheet, the 12 meter arch spreadsheet, and pulling in everybody's numbers from that spreadsheet and it consolidates them into one table for me to record their grades in my gradebook. So what type of spreadsheet should I use for a physics experiment? Well it depends on the experiment. So I'm going to for our experiment look at some data I took for a dropping object and I use this device called a ticker tape timer and basically you've got a little buzzer here that makes this pin go up and down and there's a little sheet of paper here. This is carbon paper as you can see in the diagram below. And I have this white strip of paper that goes beneath the carbon paper and the pin hits it from above. And every time the pin hits and I pull this paper through, I'll put a little dot on the pin. And you can see in this case somebody's pulling the ticker tape paper out and through the device as it makes the points. And what I did is I actually rotated this device vertically over the edge of the table and taped a 20 gram mass to the paper and let the paper fall using the mass to pull it to the ground to see if it was a 1D free fall situation. So here's a, a actual photo of one of the ticker tape timers that I used. And here's a video I took of the ticker tape timer. And this video is recorded at 240 frames per second. And when I play it back, it's playing back at a normal frame rate of 30 frames per second. So it, it slows it down. This is why we call this a slow-mo video by a factor of 8 times. 240 frames per second played at 30 gives us an 8 times slowdown. So let me show you this what this video looks like. 
Sounds like a woodpecker. And in reality, you've got to imagine this going eight times faster, and it makes a very loud, obnoxious buzz when it's doing that. But you can see it's tapping onto the carbon paper, and the sheet goes in between these two staples and pulls right underneath there, and, it, and this causes the dots to appear on the paper. The question I have here, and that we need for our lab, is to figure out what the time is between each one of these dots, because essentially we're creating a motion diagram. And you can see in each one of these cases, I've got a motion diagram for an object moving at a slow constant speed, a medium constant speed. This object looks like it's, well, it depends on which is your first and last dot. But if these are our last dots, at first we're moving slowly. We have each dot is the same time in between, and the dots are spreading out. So we must be going very quickly back here to see that, to see that big spacing. So this is for an object slowing down perhaps at a constant rate of acceleration. And this is an example of an object which in the last two dots is moving very quickly, but at first it moves slowly. So for the ticker tape that I'm using, since I'm dropping this downward, I'd expect it at first to be very slow, and the dots are very close together, and later on they'll be further apart. This is an actual photograph of the first part of my data. And you can see I was moving the paper around. You can see the dots being made. But when I had it all set up and ready to go, I dropped it. And these are the final data points you can see. Here's my starting point, my first position, second position, third position. I'll use Y values because I'm going in the Y direction in this. I'm dropping an object downward. I was using a 20 gram mass. And the question here, is this free fall or not? And that would be the objective of our lab. Um, I've written down data point numbers on here, and I laid down a meter stick along this and just measured each one of these data points in centimeters, starting the first one at zero on my meter stick. Now there's one little problem that we should consider here, is that number one, I like to work in meters, so we'll, in our spreadsheet we'll do a conversion into meters. And then the other thing is, this actually looks like the object is moving forward, and actually I would like this to start at maybe one meter, and have this work downward. And so we'll make that calculation as well. So let me show you how I determined the timing between each one of these dots. Um, I'm using VLC Media Player to, to replay my video. And here's our woodpecker going again. Let me stop this, this is annoying. Um, what I could do is actually I can step through frame by frame. And what I could do if I wanted to is I could actually go through this video and watch how many times I hit the, the paper and record the time below and just remembering this time is expanded by a factor of eight and work that out. The other thing I do is just step by frame by frame knowing that each frame is, is one two fortieth of a second and count how many frames it is between each point hitting. And the nice thing about this situation and I'll start stepping through here. So right now I'm at the bottom of my cycle so I'm making a point right about now and if I step one two, three, four frames, I'm back at the bottom. One, two, three, four frames, I'm back at the bottom. One, two, three, four frames, I'm back at the bottom. One, two, three, four frames, I'm back at the bottom. You can do this over and over again. You'll find that it's a very, very regular rate of pounding that this happens. So every four frames, I have one beat that happens on my paper. One point gets plotted on my paper. So our ultimate goal here is to take this simple column of data that I've copied off of my... So ultimately my goal is to take a simple set of data that I've copied off of my ticker tape and turn this into a spreadsheet which will calculate the times that relate to these as well as the experimental velocity and acceleration using a, a simple secant approximation between each one of these points. And then actually we'll also compare this to what the theoretical values will be over here. Um, so here's what our finished product will look like. And you can see here's our or original data that we used. And everything in green are data that we're starting with. And these are just numbers that I've typed in. Here's our initial conditions of the ball. Here's the data from the way we're using video. We have a 240 frame per sec video for a little video clip that we did for the ticker tape timer with four frames per second. And if you look up top here in my formula bar, you can see these are just plain old numbers that I've entered in. 
And down here is my data that I entered in, and you can see up here these are just plain old numbers for my dropping object, my experimental data. And I've converted that into meters and as a, as a starting point of one. And I've here's so here's my values that I'm using to drive my graph over here. And these two columns I'm using a secant approximation on consecutive points to get a slope of a secant beneath, between each consecutive point with a 0.0167 second time interval. So a pretty good approximation of my instantaneous velocity and instantaneous acceleration between each point. And over here, the last three columns are my theoretical values that I'd expect, which are using equations 5, 6, and 7 off of my constant acceleration equation sheet. And all, I, all I'm doing is driving that using my initial conditions over here. And if you look, all these cells that are in white, I'm using equations to drive these. For example, frequency is just 1 over time, and so I can take my 1 over this number, if I double click into the cell, you can see this. So this equation equals 1 over H7, which is this H7 cell right here, it's highlighted in blue, and I'm using an equation to drive that. So if I were to change my frames per tick, if it was 5, you'll notice all these numbers change, and all of my numbers over in my spreadsheets change as well. And so this is what we call a formula-driven spreadsheet. So all of my numbers ripple through all of my calculations. Um, another example of a, an equation I use for velocity, for example, is just acceleration times time plus my initial velocity. So if I click into here, you'll see that. Here's C7 in blue is right over here. That's my acceleration times B16, which is my time. So there's acceleration times time plus C6 in violet is over here. That's my initial velocity. So that equation I just used right off of my constant acceleration worksheet. So before you start, you need to actually work out what equations you will use in these different columns on your own piece of paper just to uh, show your work. And just work out a general solution to each one of these values. And you can uh, then use those equations in the Excel spreadsheet to quickly and easily generate this whole table of values, which you'll see how to do.